In our previous lessons, we have covered in the first nine chapters of Proverbs the seven speeches of the father to his son and wisdom's two speeches. We discovered in chapter 9 the dilemma that the houses and invitations of wisdom and folly are similar. How can we differentiate the two? The answer begins to take shape as we turn our attention to the second section or literary unit of Proverbs that begins in chapter 10, verse 1, and continues all the way to chapter 22, verse 16. This second unit changes in literary technique from a speech format of the first nine chapters to the more traditional form of dispensing wisdom, the short, pithy, sometimes humorous wisdom teaching commonly called a proverb. This format fills the majority of the book, hence the name Proverbs. Chapter 10 begins with a superscription in the original Hebrew, marking a new section and giving our English translations a title for Unit 2 of Proverbs. It simply says, The Proverbs of Solomon. This title attributes the Proverbs from chapters 10, verse 1, to chapter 22, verse 16, to King Solomon, the patron of proverbial wisdom in Israelite history. This second literary unit consists of 373 brief, wise observations on life. They make their point in mostly two-line proverbs. The two lines of a proverb are intended to balance, complete, and reflect on one another. Though not comprehensive by any means, let's briefly identify four functions of a proverb. The first function is to make an observation or present a principle or truth for consideration and understanding. For example, listen to the proverb in chapter 14, verse 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. The student of wisdom literature is supposed to read this proverb and identify and internalize the truth explained in the proverb. The truth being propounded is that man can be deceived. He does not always choose the best path to walk. Therefore, the proverb's primary purpose is to cause the student to pause and think and reassess his walk and choices in life. Another purpose of a proverb is to judge one thing to be better than another. Listen to the proverb in chapter 17, verse 1. Better is a dry crust of bread with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. A third function of a proverb is to make a simple, sometimes humorous comparison. Look at the proverb in chapter 10, verse 26. As vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is a sluggard to those who send him. This proverb humorously makes fun of the facial expressions one makes when smoke enters the eyes and connects that face to the expression one makes when agitated by a lazy person not doing their job. Two different problems, similar facial expressions. Another proverb of comparison is found in chapter 11, verse 22. It says, Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. The absurdity of putting a gold ring in a pig's nose is intended to emphasize the fact that they do not belong together. Something so valuable wasted on something so filthy, and for the Jewish students sitting in the classroom and listening to their fatherly teacher, the pig is spiritually unclean. The point of the proverb is driven home when the beautiful woman, like the gold ring, is partnered with immoral behavior. Though wicked men would want such sinful behavior from a beautiful woman, in the eyes of God such behavior looks like the filthy pig. It is an unwise partnership. It is unbecoming, spiritually unclean, and totally out of place. Sometimes a proverb uses a question to make a point. Consider the question found in chapter 17, verse 16. Of what use is money in the hand of a fool, since he has no desire to get wisdom? The Proverbs found in chapters 10, verse 1, to chapter 22, verse 16, unit 2, have no central theme to tie them together. The unit appears to be randomly gathered. Some would suggest the randomness of the arrangement reflects life experience, and that Proverbs, like life, resist topical or systematic groupings. 
the student's learning of Proverbs would thus parallel, organizationally, what and how he learns from life. As we study through the chapters, we are expected to agree with each proverb since their observations are pulled from everyday life and the collective experience of humankind. These proverbs provide keen insights on human behavior, both the good and the bad. They also shed light on the inner human spirit as well. Many proverbs provide guidance on how to live successfully within community. For the most part, these proverbs are optimistic and express a confidence that God is securely in control of the universe. However, let me say it again, something very important before we jump into the study of these proverbs. True wisdom is not just knowing or memorizing a proverb, but applying the right proverb for each occasion and utilizing that knowledge successfully. What I would like to do for the rest of this lesson is to introduce the different kinds or categories of proverbs and then provide examples. This will help us identify the different structures of proverbs, which is part of the key to unlocking their teaching. Scholars do not agree completely on how to categorize the proverbs. Most professors suggest there are five to seven different categories. For this study, we shall divide all the proverbs into nine different categories. We shall describe each briefly, with the plan of spending more time on them in the following lessons. The categories shed light on how each kind of proverb functions. The nine categories will give us tools we need to study each proverb more deeply. First, let us look at proverbs that are synonymous. This means the two lines of a proverb parallel the same thought or teaching. The slightly different wording in each line is intended to add description and adjectives to the principle being taught. The idea is to see the truth from a different angle or view, bringing greater insight or understanding. Seventy-five percent of all synonymous proverbs are found in chapters 16 to 22. Let me give you a few examples. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling, chapter 16, verse 8. Note that pride and a haughty spirit are parallel in thought, and so is destruction and stumbling. It is interesting to observe here a Hebrew view of pride. A haughty spirit refers to the observation that proud people often lift their eyes, put their noses in the air, and look down on others. Of course, it can also be humorous that anyone walking around like that would not be able to see clearly and would stumble over something in his path. Perhaps a double meaning to the line, too. Another synonymous proverb is found in chapter 17, verse 4. An evildoer listens to wicked lips. A liar pays attention to a destructive tongue. In Proverbs, an evildoer and liar are parallel descriptions of a wicked person. Also, wicked lips and destructive tongue are parallel instruments for communication. The two descriptions are intended to expand and reflect on each other. Another synonymous proverb is chapter 19, verse 29. Penalties are prepared for mockers and beatings for the backs of fools. Penalties and beatings describe what awaits the mocker and fools in a balanced two-line proverb. For the book of Proverbs, justice is inevitable and is powerful, underlying reason why the student of wisdom should pay attention and obey proverbial teachings. The second group of Proverbs is called antithetical. This means the two lines contain opposing thoughts or concepts. The opposing thought may be in the subject, the action, or the consequence found in both lines. Antithetical Proverbs dominate chapters 10 to 15 and chapters 28 to 29. In fact, 85% of all antithetical Proverbs are found within these eight chapters. Let me give you a few examples. A poor man pleads for mercy, but a rich man answers harshly. Chapter 18, verse 23. This proverb does not provide a theological judgment or spiritual truth. It simply reflects the differing speech patterns and attitudes between the rich man and the poor man. 
This proverb contains a timeless and universal truth of the human condition, namely, wealth affects the way a person speaks. Learning this proverbial truth brings us closer to understanding human beings and can teach us to examine others and monitor our own speech patterns. Another antithetical proverb is found in chapter 15, verse 20. A wise son brings joy to his father, but a foolish man despises his mother. The wise son and foolish man are contrasted by how they affect their parents. For the Hebrew sages, a wise and godly son brings great joy to his parents, while the foolish son, meaning wicked and rebellious, despises his mother. Every parent can understand the truth of this proverb. It reflects a relational principle shared between the parents and their children. It is a truth about humans no matter what culture they come from. An interesting proverb with an often repeated principle in this book is found in chapter 13, verse 11. It says, Dishonest money dwindles away, but he who gathers little by little makes it grow. Dishonest gain by theft, robbery, deception, murder, or wicked business practices is thoroughly condemned in Proverbs and strengthened with the teaching that such riches will fail, not last, become suddenly lost, or forcibly removed. On the other hand, the wise man who works hard, conducts business honestly, and observes his religious and community duties will see his wealth and prosperity grow. For the book of Proverbs, there is a right way and a wrong way to gain wealth, and the students of wisdom should learn the difference between them. The third kind of Proverbs is called synthetic. This means the second line of the proverb advances or completes a thought introduced in the first line. Seventy percent of all synthetic Proverbs are found in chapters 16 to 22 and chapters 26 and 27. The remaining 30% are found almost exclusively in the literary units attributed to Solomon. An example of a synthetic proverb is chapter 11, verse 7. When a wicked man dies, his hope perishes, and all he expected from his power comes to nothing. The second line does not parallel or contrast the first. It expands or completes the thought of the first line. In this sense, the proverb highlights the futility of the wicked's plans and dreams. This fate is for all evil people because proverbs would teach us they are without the help and protection of the Lord. Another synthetic proverb is found in chapter 18, verse 8. The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to a man's inmost being. The words of a gossip are compared to tasty food that we would eagerly eat, enjoy its flavor, and appreciate the internal satisfaction we feel after consuming it. Such physical satisfaction one feels from a banquet of food describes the emotional satisfaction one feels in receiving gossip. A warning is hinted at in the second line, allowing the poisonous words of the gossip to enter deep down into our inmost being sets up a potentially disastrous consequence, perhaps physically and emotionally. The fourth category of Proverbs is admonitions. Here, both lines of the proverb combine to teach good behavior by the use of warnings, commands, and prohibitions. They often sound like a stern parental warning. Admonitions are not found in the first 13 chapters of Proverbs or the last two, but they are spread evenly throughout chapters 14 to 29. Consider the admonitional proverb of chapter 19, verse 20. Listen to advice and accept instruction, and in the end you'll be wise. There is no parallel or contrasting thoughts between lines 1 and 2. Some could say this is close to a synthetic proverb. The difference between a synthetic proverb and an admonition concerns the way in which the principle is presented. Synthetic proverbs offer an observation or principle for consideration. The admonition takes the form of a warning, a command, or even a parental rebuke. Let's look at another admonitional proverb in chapter 14, verse 7. Stay away from a foolish man, for you will not find knowledge on his lips. Or another in chapter 19, verse 27. 
Stop listening to instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. And let me add another admonition proverb from chapter 22, verse 6. Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. In these proverbs, you can almost hear the parental advice being given to the young man or new parent. The proverbs are filled with wisdom about the kind of fellows one should avoid, the mental posture one should have for gaining wisdom, and the importance of disciplining children in order to maximize their opportunity for a life full of blessings, honor, righteousness, and success. A fifth kind of proverb is what I call better sayings. This proverb is normally a two-line proverb identifying the better of two choices or circumstances. Almost all of these proverbs tend to take two comparisons where the answers would be obvious and then pair them up against each other with a slight twist to force the student to prioritize the better of the two good options. They are easily identified because they begin with the word better. Nearly all of these proverbs are found in chapters 15 to 21. Let's look at a proverb in chapter 15, verse 16. Better a little with fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. And another proverb of similar thought in chapter 16, verse 8. Better a little with righteousness than much gain with injustice. And another in chapter 28, verse 6. Better the poor whose walk is blameless than the rich whose ways are perverse. All of these proverbs undergird the proverbial wisdom that it's better to be poor or have little and remain right with God than to gain wealth through wicked activity. The oddity of these teachings is that proverbs generally would have us believe that seeking wisdom and following God brings about riches and wealth. Should wealth accumulate, the wise man would understand that following God is more important than the riches he gains. A similar teaching of valuing a simple meal over a feast can be found in chapter 15, verse 17. Better a meal of vegetables where there is love than a fattened calf with hatred. Another value statement on the human condition is found in chapter 12, verse 9. Better to be a nobody and yet have a servant than to pretend to be somebody and have no food. And a more humorous proverb, at least for the husband, is chapter 25, verse 24. Better to live on a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. For some reason, the fatherly wisdom of this last proverb is repeated word for word in chapter 21, verse 9, and altered slightly but emphasized again in chapter 21, verse 19. A sixth kind of proverb takes the form of simile. This English literature term means the two lines compare two unlike things. Simile proverbs often begin with the words like or as. In this sense, the proverb seeks to draw a comparison between two unlike things in order to find a common connection, provide a principle, or give an insight. Simile proverbs dominate chapters 25 and 26. Only eight other such proverbs exist in the rest of the book, and they are found in the sections attributed to King Solomon. Let us look at the simile proverb in chapter 25, verse 14. Like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of gifts he does not give. We have all seen clouds and wind that gave the impression rain was near, and then it not rain. Sometimes it has even looked and smelled like rain. We may even have heard the thunder and seen the lightning. Still it passed us by. The boasting of the man in the second line is intended to parallel the thundering and lightning of the clouds that give no rain, a lot of wind and noise and visual display, but no real personal benefit. Another simile proverb is found in chapter 25, verse 19. Like a bad tooth or a lame foot is reliance on the unfaithful in times of trouble. I laugh when I read this. Most of us have experienced the pain of a bad tooth or the hurt when we twist an ankle. The point of the second line connects the physical pain to the emotional and social pain we suffer when someone fails to help us in a time of real need. There is even a more disturbing point to this proverb. In Solomon's day, bad teeth could not be repaired. The tooth and lame foot were permanent conditions. The second line suggests the failure of unfaithful people may bring lasting results. The wise man will not trust the unfaithful to rescue him in times of trouble. He should seek help from reliable, faithful friends. 
A seventh kind of proverb is called couplets. Instead of two lines, these proverbs use four lines to teach a concept or complete a thought. Such proverbs tend to be expanded proverbs in character because they develop a thought more extensively than the normal two-line proverbs. Couplets dominate chapters 23 and 24 and are numerous in chapter 25. Few couplets are found outside these chapters. Let's look at a couplet in chapter 24, verses 19 and 20. Do not fret because of evil men, or be envious of the wicked. For the evil man has no future hope, and the lamp of the wicked will be snuffed out. The student of wisdom should not be afraid or envious of the wicked, no matter how powerful or wealthy they become, because their future is not secure. Proverbs believes the strength, power, and wealth of the wicked will fail or be taken away in a moment. The wicked who appear to be powerful in the present have no future. They will come to ruin and shame. The wise student should not be tempted by such vaporous appearances of prosperity, for Proverbs teaches they have no lasting substance. The eighth category of Proverbs is numerical sayings. There are seven numerical sayings in the book of Proverbs. One is found in chapter 6, verses 16 to 19. The other six are grouped in chapter 30. These Proverbs use a Hebraic list of observations with a formula of X and X plus 1. For example, there are six things, X, the Lord hates, seven, X plus 1, that are detestable to him haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a man who stirs up dissension among brothers. Chapter 6, verses 16 to 19. Numerical sayings provide a list of items that fulfill the characteristic or description presented at the beginning. Often the list would at first glance not appear connected in any way. Several of the lists provide a humorous twist, such as the saying in chapter 30, verses 30 and 31. There are three things that are stately in their stride, four that move with stately bearing, a lion, mighty among beasts who retreats before nothing, a strutting rooster, a he-goat, and a king with his army around him. The connecting characteristic is how each walks. They are each powerful in their realm. However, there is also an underlying humorous point that pride may have something to do with the way that they walk as well. The ninth and last category of Proverbs is generically called longer sayings. This category includes verses that appear in the form of speeches, short stories, or extended observations that contain more than two or four lines. These dominate chapters 1 to 9 and chapters 30 to 31. The seven speeches of the father to his son in chapters 1 to 9 fall into this category, as well as the sayings of Agur and Lemuel in chapters 30 and 31. Other longer sayings include warnings against drinking, chapter 23, and laziness, chapter 24, putting up a security for a stranger, chapter 6, promoting business wisdom, chapter 27, or describing the good wife, chapter 31. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? Who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Those who linger over wine, who go to sample bowls of mixed wine. Do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Your eyes will see strange sights and your mind imagine confusing things. You will be like the one sleeping on the high seas lying on top of the rigging. They hit me, you will say, but I am not hurt. They beat me, but I didn't feel it.